государства, да? Американцы, американцы спонсировали. И вот сейчас, спустя 12 лет, он приехал снова к нам в надежде, что э, мы сможем продолжить сотрудничество. И вот сейчас бы он хотел рассказать вам об системе образования, System of Education, in the USA, we'd like to talk about or just to talk about the opportunities. Um, start with the opportunities. О возможностях образования, получения образования в США. If there are questions about the system, I'll take those questions too. Да, вопросы, если будут, тоже любые вопросы, связанные с образованием, пожалуйста, задавайте. Но лекция у нас, презентация будет на английском языке, пожалуйста. Вопросы, соответственно, тоже на английском языке. Thank you very much, uh, Eugenia, Eugenia uh, Alexandrovna. My name is David Robinson, right there, and this is my email address. I'd love to hear your questions today, but some of you may think of questions later. You're welcome to ask me. And Это также возможно по-русски. По-украински труднее. I want to speak to you in English today, and I know many of you are not advanced students, so I will speak slowly. My own students in the United States include quite a few international students, uh, we've had them from Russia, we've had them from Bulgaria. I don't think I've had a student from Ukraine. But they tell me that of all their professors, they understand me the best. I have a central um, USA accent that's not much of an accent. And I have a big voice. I can speak loudly. So, if I speak too quickly, or you would like for me to repeat something, just raise your hand and say, or if it's important, ask me again uh, to repeat it. Uh, I put a little outline, uh, I don't know if you can read my handwriting, uh, but uh, I want to talk about my experience in international education, because a long time ago, uh, I was growing up on a farm in southern Indiana, in the middle of the country. I'd never been to a foreign country. My parents uh, were and are pretty poor people. They didn't want me to go. They couldn't give me money to go anyway. Uh, but I got myself a good education. So I want to tell you about that and why, why I think an experience in a foreign country has been so important to me. There are other people sitting in the room who have more ideas about this. Most important, by the end, I'd like to know or have questions or ask you to tell me what you would like to experience uh, in education abroad. Why it might be important to you. Or ask me, is it possible? Could I do this? Would this be a good idea? Again, I'd love to hear the ideas today. If the ideas come to you later, please email me. Um, after I talk about my own experience, I'll talk about particular programs that help international students. Some of the programs I have done myself. Some of them I help with as an official. 
uh, to help choose people. I'll say a little bit about what I know about uh, UK, maybe Australia, other English-speaking places, because they're good, they have good education programs too. It's not just the United States, of course. Uh, and I've given you, for general information, uh, I think it's only in English, but I'm not sure. It might have other languages too. Uh, a website that I find useful, Scholars for Development, uh, dot com that talks about these programs and many others. I'll warn you that on such websites you often get advertisements that you should buy this or you should you know meet with us, give us money. And the first thing I want to say is you don't need money to get an education abroad. Well, you do need money. Somebody needs to give it to you, right? If you have some money, you want to spend it in the best way. I don't think you want to spend money on courses for TOEFL and other things. You want to do this yourself and with your, with your teachers. Um, so don't be taken in by the business. Become part of the business yourself. That is, maybe you'll give courses <laughs> for TOEFL someday. Um, the third one, did someone have a question? No. <laughs> if you study in an English-speaking university, you will probably have to take an exam. And I think most of you know, at least have heard about TOEFL. Maybe you have some questions. Uh, there are other exams. I think the one called IELTS, the British Council, is uh, useful in many countries, and not just Britain. And then finally, um, what experience do you want? What experience, what interests you about foreign language experience? Uh, as I told you, I grew up as a, a, a farm boy, but I had a good piece of luck in that when I was uh, 18 years old, I wrote an application. That's in Russian, Yavlenia, right? Yeah. My application was to Harvard University. I was just 18 years old. I was living on a farm. And I did my best. Um, I wrote, you know, from the heart, as we say. And I had good grades in school, and pretty good grades on the tests that we take before college. And they accepted me. It's a very expensive place, Harvard. You've heard of it, right? You say it a little differently in Russian. Yeah, right. And you, in, in, a long time ago, only rich people would go there. But they gave me scholarship to go there. My parents paid nothing. Today, if you pay for Harvard, I think it's $60,000 every year, which is unimaginable. Most Americans don't make that much money in their families. So what did this do for me? Well, it gave me some of the best teachers in the world, but mostly it helped me to make connections to the things I always cared about. I was a student of chemistry. I loved science. I became more interested in history and in European culture while I was at Harvard. And finally, I got a chance to go to study in a foreign country. I wanted to go to Germany. I'd been studying German since high school. I was very interested in the problem. If you remember your history, when I was a child, there were two Germanys, right? And so this was an interesting problem for me, too. In Germany was where the problems of our world were meeting, east and west. Soviet and American. So that I wanted to go see. And I could speak the language. I thought I could speak the language. So once again, you write the application, right? This time, though, because it was. Please. This time, because it was a very. Um, expensive grant. I was asking to get money to fly to Germany and to study there for a year. Uh, they accepted my application, but I had to come for an interview too. 
and it was for the Rotary Fellowship. You have Rotary Clubs in, in Ukraine. I know you have one in Odessa. You can apply for their fellowship to study abroad. Not only in America, but just about any country where there are Rotary Clubs, and that's about everywhere. So this is one you should remember and look up. It's one that worked for me. I lived in uh, Munich the year uh, and um, learned German very well. Then became time to make a choice for my career. This is something I'm very interested about you too. What will you do after university? For a few of you it's obvious if you're trying to become a teacher or uh, you want to go into publishing or something and you're learning language for this reason, it might be obvious. For most of you, ish. I think I know what I want, but how, how am I going to do it? And that was my problem too. Uh, I came back and I applied to learn history. It was probably a big mistake. I could have become a wealthy man if I would stayed in computers in those days, but uh, I was interested in history. So I went to Berkeley, University of California, near San Francisco, and there was a very good history program to do what you would call kandidatska, a work in history. I got a chance to apply for more study abroad, this time as research for my PhD, as we call it in America, the kandidatska, similar here. And for that, uh, I didn't uh, want the Fulbright. In those days, we had no Fulbright in East Germany. I wanted to go to East Germany, and all we had for that was IREX. And these are very special grants that probably are not for you anymore. Um, Prorector Spivakovsky used an IREX grant recently, and that's what they tend to be used for, is for um, special projects for people already in the university. But I got one as a student to go to Leipzig in East Germany, uh, where I got to watch the Russian army uh, <laughs> run around from time, or the Soviet army run around from time to time. It was a life-changing experience for me. It gave me uh, an interest in Eastern Europe. It gave me uh, a desire to finish my degree and begin teaching about history, German history, in our universities. As I started doing that, um, I began to re learn Russian language. Uh, I thought German was not enough, learn Russian. We had a very good exchange program for teachers called ACTR, and I think they have ACTR also has some foreign language programs for students. Is that right, acronym? Something like that. You can find it. It's for foreign language teaching. So these teachers came to my school from Moscow State University, and I learned Russian from them. I think pretty well. It was, it was a, good, a good program. And I talked to people from Fulbright. I said, I want to go to Russia. I'd like to go to Moscow. And they said, oh, it's very difficult now. This was 1990. Six ninety-seven. Would you like to go to maybe Irkutsk or Yakutsk? We can send you there. <laughs> and I said, mm, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And they said, but if you wanted to go to Ukraine, you could go to Ukraine. And I said, Ukraine? Of course, that would be perfect. And so that's how I decided, I first thought about going to Moscow, and then, but I was interested in the history of higher education. Where are there great universities? Well, of course, Moscow, Kazan, St. Petersburg, but Kharkov, Kiev, Odessa, right, you know. So I thought, yeah, I'll go to Odessa, that's where I'll go. And in Moscow, when I was visiting, I made friends with a boy from Kherson. And when I talked to the talked to the Fulbright people, they said, oh, everybody wants to go to Lviv or to um, Kiev. And many Fulbright people have been to Odessa too. Uh, here's a list of places we'd like to send people. And on that list was Kherson. I said, I want to go to Kherson. 
And they said, why do you want to go to Arizona? <laughs> Nobody's ever been there before from Fulbright. I said, exactly. That's why I want to go. And of course, I knew I had a friend here who would help me. And if you have one friend in Kherson, soon you have many friends in Kherson, right? I mean, it was, it was, and I also brought two other professors with me. And they were afraid to come at first. They wanted to go to Estonia. This is not Estonia. And they're very happy that they came. Um, their son has married a Ukrainian girl, and they have grandchildren now that are half Ukrainian. Um, but um, that's how I got here, uh, as you heard, with the Fulbright program. Since then, I've worked with international education in every way I could. Uh, I've helped to choose Fulbright people in Ukraine to go to the United States. Uh, I helped people in Kherson to fill out applications for Muskie. Uh, it's not it's not bad to ask people for help, really. Uh, I'd say it's bad to pay them for it. You know, I, I think that kind of thing you need to be able to do yourself. But if you go to the professionals and ask them for help, it's a good thing. And usually they want to give it to you. Now, if all of you come on the same day, I'm not sure <laughs> if it will work. Um, the United States then sponsors through private organizations or charitable organization like Rotary or Fulbright, Muskie, what am I thinking of, many different other programs. They have a list of them and there's a list of them on this website too, uh, are usually funded by the United States government. Uh, so they have a lot of rules, but basically if you're a student here, you're probably, and you're a Ukrainian citizen, you're probably eligible. Uh, about United Kingdom, I know less, except that they probably have more exchange with Ukraine these days than even the United States does, because of the integration of Europe, which even includes the United Kingdom and Ukraine. Uh, Chevening is one uh, one scholarship that looks a lot like Fulbright. Now, when can you do this if you decide to do it? For the Rotary, they say you need to have finished two years in university. For Fulbright, three or four. You want to check. And I think it's the same for these. So these two are, you would think of as the master's level. And you understand what I mean by ma master's or magister, right? This, this way of thinking. So most of you are right at the level of diploma or something like that, or, or bachelor's, right? So you're ready to think about it. Maybe some of you are ready to do it. Uh, and you can find out all these requirements on this website and the websites of the places that it sends you to. If you are accepted as a Fulbright student, you probably go to a U.S. university to a master's program. And it could be, for many of you, in English literature or in um, teaching language methodology and education. I'm not sure what all your fields are. Uh, it could be in other fields as well. So we had a student go from psychology. She had uh, been in, here in Ukrainian English program, right? You know that one? You still have it, probably, Ukrainian English. But she had studied a lot of psychology, and her advisor, the American, she worked for him, had interested her in psychology, so she said, I'm going to go to America and get a master's degree in psychology. And she did it, with the Fulbright. Um, I had the privilege of sitting on the panel um, that chose her, but I didn't vote because I knew her. <laughs> I'll just ask a few questions. I can't make a decision. Everyone else thought she was uh, good. I think that was the first year students were sent to America with Fulbright, and they sent 12 of them. Now I think it's more like 25 a year from Ukraine, something like that, maybe 30. 
not as big as it should be. But all these people are getting uh, valuable experience. And someone from Kherson can do it. Because she did it the very first year. Um, OK. She was chosen by her application. And they also brought her to Kiev. You know, they paid for it. Fulbright did. And paid for her to take the TOEFL in Kiev. If you pay for it yourself, it's about $150 American dollars, maybe 200 some of them are more advanced. But I would say more than 100 less than $200. But they paid for that, and they also brought her in for the interview, and then later she found out that she got it. So if the Fulbright pays, for, for me if I have a Fulbright, for your teacher if she has a Fulbright, for you, if you have a Fulbright, pays for the TOEFL, pays for you to fly to the United States and works with the institution to put you in the proper um, program that might be a little different because of language and other preparation, you might take some different courses. Uh, that's one difference in the American and the um, um, state uh, university system here. Is there a lot, there's a lot of flexibility in our program, so you can do things differently. Each student can do things differently. And that's true at the bachelor's degree level as well as the master's. So I think that helps a foreign student when they come. You might have maybe psychology, but not enough mathematics. So you take lower level mathematics to fill in and prepare yourself. And I think that that's a good that's a good uh, a good thing for a uh, a student coming from Ukraine to the United States. What's involved with the TOEFL? Uh, well, let me ask you: Who knows about TOEFL? Has anyone here taken one? Nobody. Madam, <laughs> what said? Did you not take the TOEFL? I did. You when, did. When I was in the U.S. Okay. She did. You haven't taken it yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. What do you remember about it? Yeah, there were a few steps, like um, comprehension, listening, Listen. okay. and uh, conversation. You listen to a conversation uh -huh. between two people. And it's done, was it done on computer for you? Yes. Yeah. And writing. And then at the end you wrote yourself. No, writing I meant an essay. You have to write an essay. Yes. They give you a topic. Yes. And you have to write an essay. And you have a certain amount of uh, time. Very limited. Right. I think about a half of an hour. Very short time to write a small essay. Uh, I think this is the part that scares people the most. Of course, it's kind of scary if you're listening to something and you're not sure what, if you're understanding exactly what you need to understand. Uh, but uh, the writing, you know, what happens if you, you just can't, you know, that's the thing. So, obviously, you have to be well prepared for TOEFL. But I've known students even who didn't have very good classes in English language, like all of you have had, to prepare themselves. The materials can be found on, on the online on websites for free. They will also try to sell you with lots of courses, but you don't have to buy them. You can find many, many materials for free. You can probably buy books in the secondhand bookstore. You say, well, they're not the most recent one. Well, how much has English changed in 10 years, really? You know, maybe the test has changed, but you'll check that out as you check out the website. So TOEFL um, scares people, I think. And it should. I would not be able to pass one in Russian, I'm sure, if we had the same thing. I think I did in German. I got that good in German, but not in Russian. The ELTS is uh, pretty much the same thing, except that you have to speak as well or in some parts of it, or in some versions of it, uh, the, person has, the, the, the person who's tested has to speak. And I don't think they've ha they have this in TOEFL yet. 
before you speak. They do have speaking part. They do have now. They do have. And they do it on a computer, probably. Right. Yeah. So they record you and then, okay, so I'm not sure what exactly TOEFL would be required of you, whether the speaking would be required, but all these things are available and the most recent information, as you hear, is available to you at the International Office. Um, they can show you the website, how to begin. So I guess um, these general things uh, is all I really have prepared to say to you. What I'm most interested in is what you are interested in and whether you think um, you have an idea that you'd like to ask me about. You know, can I do this? Is it possible to do that? Uh, it was suggested to me that, um, that I might mention work experience. Probably many of you know about the, the program that the State Department runs for um, students mostly, as I understand it, certainly young people, to come and work in the summer. Work and travel. Work and travel. Yeah. Have any of you done this? No. You did? No, I'm going to do this next year. You, you're ready to do it? Yes. Oh, yes. And uh, my friend uh, has, already, has already done this uh -huh. uh, this summer. And she's very uh, happy and uh, she is satisfied. And uh, um, um, she has uh, very good emotions and good impressions. Where did she work? Uh, she worked uh, in, in, in entertainment. In entertainment, where? Theme park. Park attraction. Theme park. But 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 do you know what state or what uh, city? No, uh, we know that she um, you know, was um, in her free time. Uh, she was in Good. Chicago. Okay. Uh, she was in New York. And also she okay. traveled. Okay, so she probably worked in a theme park with children yeah. or maybe in a restaurant, you know, it's possible that way too. Uh, with American kids, right? Same thing. And, um, and then had some free time to travel. Yes, she worked for uh, four hours a day. And, uh, four, hours four hours a day? Hours a day. Yeah. And she had a lot of free time. <laughs> I've heard terrible stories about people working too hard in a place that's so far away that they can't ever go anywhere and see anybody. But this sounds like she had a very good, a good location. So I would, I would, be, I would say that be careful about your assignment where they, where they ask you to go. If it's, you, you know that in the United States most people have cars and they can drive somewhere. Well, you're probably not going to be that. Maybe no one you live with will have a car. So you want to know: is there public transportation? And you may have heard that public transportation, as much as you complain about it in Kherson, is so much better than in any other American city, except maybe for New York or Chicago. That's about it. Uh, we have bad problems with transportation. So you want to be somewhere where you're close to a bus or a train or just close to the places that you'd like to, to be, because then you can get transportation. So there's work and study. Uh, what else are people interested in? Either education or other things. We've talked with the um, office about problems with visas. And I do want to warn you there are big problems with getting visas. Usually not through, obviously, programs that are sponsored by the American government. If they're going to choose you, they're going to help you get the visa. Um, work, work and travel. travel. <laughs> work and travel seems to have pretty good luck too. You have your visa already? No, but I'm... They told you it's probably going to be okay. Yeah, okay. It's not... Uh, it's not uh, unusual to be concerned about these problems. Uh, when I, every student I worked with was always concerned about these problems and we had troubles. So I always you know, write letters asking the State Department to do a better job with these things. Uh, 
not to take people's money for applications and then send them away. Once I stood in the line in the embassy or in the consulate in Kiev with a student, which, you know, Americans are not supposed to stay in line with the Ukrainians, but I did. And I got to see everything that happened. So I understand this problem. I wish I could fix it. Maybe there'll be some changes in the law in the next year or two that can fix us. We've been discussing this in the international office. This question, this questioner spoke very clearly in English, and I understood it very well. If you have a question, but it's too difficult to ask, please ask it in Russian. Or Ukrainian. Someone will help me. <laughs> it's in Russian, I probably understand. Uh, what other kinds of can you travel abroad as a tourist? How many of you have been able to do that to EU countries? Anyone? See, that's... Bulgaria, okay. Yes, Bulgaria can work. Tell us please about your experience. You've been to Bulgaria recently. Uh, yes, I can tell that uh, we recently were in Bulgaria and the street was uh, made by our university. Oh, good. Uh, organized. Organized, yes, organized by our university. Uh, we spent there uh, um, 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say that so we had free time and we could do everything we wanted, but except there was one trigger uh, to Shumen where we had an opportunity to meet uh, the mayor. The mayor of that city. Uh, we have an opportunity to speak with, uh, with him. And uh, uh, as our pretend we spent visiting different seasides. Uh, I can say that it was quite interesting to see the new universities, uh, the, the organizations of universities. Uh, also, it is uh, of course interesting to see new <coughs> culture and to meet a uh, lot of new people. Uh, but one thing that I can say, it was a problem that not everyone uh, here understands English. Uh, when we wanted to um, know the uh, when we wanted to know where it is situated uh, this or that place and we tried to ask about that in English, people don't, didn't understand us and so we must, uh, they show us with hands and only in Bulgarian and we try to understand them. Could they understand your Russian? It was quite Not difficult so but uh, we understood bit. our Bulgarian with yeah. our Russian, we could do yeah. that. But well, those, those are interesting experiences. Uh, you know, uh, one thing that people do, in, a, um, in some ways, we romanticize. Uh, well, I met a, a boy in high school here. He says, I want to study in London and live there the rest of my life. Now, you've probably heard these stories before. Does a boy who's 15 know that that's what he wants? Uh, as I get to know this boy a little better, he's the, the, the nephew of a friend of mine, I'm thinking maybe he does. <laughs> maybe he really knows what he's talking about. He's pretty good. His language is good. But usually we find that when we go abroad and stay abroad, it's not easy. You get very lonely. Uh, you find out that, you know, life in America is not as much fun as you thought it would be. Of course, you expect everything to be very expensive, and you're given, you know, you're given some money to do this if you have an exchange program, but it's, it's worry, worries you. But it's more than that. It's that people don't have parties the same way they do here. We don't celebrate people's birthdays, really. I know, you look at me, is that possible? <laughs> um, going to the beach is a different kind of thing. Um, people under 21 are not allowed to drink alcohol legally. So they do it illegally, but... <laughs> 
you know, all these things, you know, to a, a Ukrainian young person is something that you have to get used to. And um, I asked, um, it was about someone who'd gone to Kiev, uh, but it could have been someone who'd gone to London. I said, well, how's he doing there? You know, is he doing okay? He wanted to go to Kiev, he went to Kiev. Yes, his work is okay, he's doing fine, but he's lonely. So what does that mean? In a place like Kherson, or the place that is your home, you don't think about it, but you have a lot of support. Um, someone who wants to congratulate you for your birthday. Someone who wants to uh, bake you a cake. Someone who wants to go to the movies with you all the time. And then you go to a new place, and it's not that way, not in the beginning. Or maybe you go to a big city like Chicago, and you don't feel confident, not at first. But what we find is that everybody who does it, a few exceptions, but almost everybody who does it, gets through that period. And for me, it's about a month or six weeks. Now, they didn't happen in Kherson, I have to tell you. As soon as I got here, there were people. I was never feeling lonely, not a day because I think that's the kind of city, the kind of culture you have here. But if I, I'm sure if I went to Lviv or Kiev, it'd be different, right? So that's something you can imagine. And going to a different country, you also feel lonely and isolated. So why would you want to do it? Why would any of you be interested in it? What will it bring you? And if you have an idea, no. <laughs> Why will you go? Your friend gave you good ideas that... But it's not the only one friend. You know others? Yes. Did anybody have a really bad time? No, no. Not really, no. There are difficulties, right? Maybe there are lucky ones. No, I think, I think there are always difficulties. But uh, by the time they came back... But they travel, um, maybe they Third person, so. right. and they were friends, and maybe it's they helped they each helped other. Each other yes. yeah. Good. If you you know get something like Rotary or Fulbright, you probably go alone. But, uh, I can add that my friend had bad experience in remote control problem mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when firstly when she got there, got there, mm -hmm. uh, they had nowhere to leave. Yes. Uh, the flat uh, which uh, was uh, advised them, uh, the owners of the club, of that those flat, mm -hmm. uh, didn't know about them, mm -hmm. and uh, they had to search mm -hmm. their own flat. They had to find they their own flat. Find their own flat. Which is and horrible experience. Yeah. yeah. I did it in Kherson, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also at work. Uh, they were unexpected of those work, and they had to, to search other work there. Really? Yeah. Were they successful in solving all those problems? Uh, yeah, and uh, she uh, found two works, and she had to work uh, on two works, and uh, because of pain, she knew that. Oh, so she ended up having, she, it, it turned out that she had to spend all her money on paying for the flat. Um, or a lot of it. At first. Yeah. But uh, then um, um, they leave. I don't remember how many people leave. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, legally they uh, were um, four. Mm -hmm. in fact, but uh, they were about uh, 16 persons. 16 or 16 six? 16 or six? At first 16. Uh, uh, 16. All, 16. And then uh, the number uh, increased. Decreased. 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 Yeah. Decreased. I had similar problems in, with my first year in Germany. Because um, Munich was a very expensive city. And I had very little help finding a flat. So that's another thing you want to think about. Ask. Also, 
if you have a program like Fulbright or um, uh, Work and Travel, make sure that you have a connection to the, the responsible person, the director, or the program officer, whatever they call the person who's supposed to be there to help you solve those problems. Because usually, I know it's true for Fulbright, we have a lot of problems. Um, I'll tell you an interesting one. Um, we didn't know who was in charge. It seemed the only name we had was Eugenia Spivakovsky. And she wasn't there. She was a student working in the international office. And the Fulbright uh, office in Kiev had a new director, and he didn't know anyone in Kherson. So we assumed that Eugenia Spivakovsky was the director of the international office in Kherson. When we arrived, we were looking for her. They said, oh, Eugenia, she's a student. She's not the director of the office. Isn't that a funny story? Because now... How did you get that information? Where did you get it? You know, we, we, we... I did this with the director. We looked at all the email and we tried to find out. I think one time you responded. You were helping with the English in the... In the Translation. You were doing translation, somehow they got your name, and they thought that you were the director. So the funny thing about it is, who is now the director of the office? <laughs> okay. And so you found out that uh, the director was someone else yeah, when oh, you got here. Oh, uh, uh, um, um, Augustana Sala, right? Yeah. Uh, but we didn't know who she was. But she was there at the airport in Odessa. And she told us <laughs> we were expecting Eugenia, who was just a student working in the office. Working part time. Not, and she wasn't even there anymore. She was doing something else. So uh, a lot of things. This is miscommunication, right? Uh, that can happen. Uh, happens very easily when some people speak only English and other people speak Russian or Ukrainian. Um, which is part of your job. And this, I guess that's one answer. Those of you who want to work in international business, in the arts that are international, want to help in government work that has to be international, you need English, German, other foreign languages that you're all Spanish, all that you're studying. Uh, in order to do this work well and to build a bigger and better future for yourselves, your city, your country, your families. So that's one easy answer that probably we all share in that. But are there special interests um, that any of you have in studying abroad? I know you can tell, you don't have to tell me about yourself, you can tell me about a friend of yours. <laughs> who would like to do something or might be interested in something. Uh, the reason I'm asking is I want to see if our programs can help you. Good. Yeah, it's just the room is a bit hard. It costs, it costs uh, the applicant $2,000. Because, I mean, I, I can understand the visa would be $150. Oh, uh, uh, so that they, I, they think that you will earn this money when you come back, before you come back. It seems like you should buy it back, but... if you don't have it... Yes, how can you... That is a very good question. I'll write that down. So if, for example, work and travel had a scholarship fund or a loan fund, and someone is successful, meets all qualifications, gets the visa, etc., you can pay it back later, but you don't have to pay it before. This would be better, wouldn't it? Yes, and uh, I, I would like, for me, I would like to study there. I would like to experience uh, the system, uh, the education system of USA. 
I don't want to uh, walk. I don't want to walk. Yeah, you don't want to be in a restaurant or something yes. like that. Yeah. What is your um, your uh, uh, course of study? Ukrainian and English language. Yes, okay. Yes, and I'm interested in psychology too. I mm -hmm. I went to uh, therapy one year this mm -hmm. so, um, Maybe you heard something about Gestalt therapy? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, I know a lot about it. I study German history. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I know some of the people personally. <laughs> Yeah. And I try to find an opportunity to go to study. Well, look at Rotary. Look at this website. Uh, look at things that are oriented towards psychology and toward therapy. And see, uh, and I guess my, my general answer is see if you are ready to make an application and then talk to people about the application. Talk to people in your international office, email me. I can put you in contact with psychologists in America to think about advice for um, a good place for your interests. Because we have thousands of colleges and universities in the United States. I mean, at least, at least a thousand. I don't know how many we have. So the, the choices are hard. Uh, and many of them that you've never heard of are very good. And sometimes, you know, you write down what you know, Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley. Well, a lot of people write those names down, right? But if you write down, you know, uh, State University of New York, Potsdam, and you want to study business there, and the Fulbright people know that that's a good choice, that makes a difference, you know? And also, that university probably wants you. Okay, here's another thing that I didn't talk about. You can go study abroad for one or two years for Masters with Fulbright or Rotary. You could actually go to university abroad, even right out of high school. You still have to do the TOEFL and all that sort of thing. How would you pay for it, right? How much would it cost? Um, if you go to a not expensive state university and you stay with a family and maybe they are your sponsors or in the case of one Russian boy I knew whose family had some money, but you're a good student, the university will usually give you about half, at least half in scholarship. So it would end up costing maybe, I'm going to say ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year. That's about the lowest. Can you get that ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year from a university? Maybe, but it's more difficult. That sponsorship usually comes from some person or from charitable organization. But if you're a good student, the university sponsors you more than half, and that would be for the whole degree. Um, I believe after she got uh, her master's degree. Our Fulbright student from Kherson was admitted to a doctoral program in Canada. Actually, it's admitted in the United States and in Canada. But the one in Canada gave her full, um, full um, scholarship and work. I mean, all together. And she was in psychology, so she's now a psychologist. So it is possible. How do you begin? That's probably the hardest thing. Oh. If you have ten or fifteen thousand dollars, you know somebody who does. Maybe you could go ahead and begin, but that would only be the first year, right? So that that's the kind of problem about just studying in the United States. You know, just going and getting an American degree. There are also exchange programs where you can go for just a few weeks or one summer. Sometimes. Those are sponsored by charitable organizations, and you can compete for scholarships for those. I didn't talk about those, but that's short. Sure. You know, that's just, it's almost like work and study only is just study. But you could look and see if there's something like that. If you're in first or second year, and you have a chance to go see if you really want it, like I thought about that boy, does he really want to live in London? Does he know what that's like? 
he has a vision of a different London than the one I visit. I personally like living in Carson better <laughs> than London. It's more interesting to me. Uh, because I can go to Kiev and Yalta and Odessa, etc. when I'm living in Kherson. Kherson is very interesting to me. Uh, and London is not, because everyone speaks English there, pretty much. And I'm an American, you know, Americans and British, they don't always have much interest in each other. Someone else has an idea or a question. This was a very good question about the $2,000. I'm, uh, I'm going to look into that and see if they have some alternatives. Well, I can see that, you know, you ask all your relatives, right? You get $100 here and $200 there, right? And you say, I will pay it back to you, you know, when I come back. I'm sure you're all doing this, right? And, you know, they say, well, okay. But in some villages, you just don't even have that. So there should be a way. In some, sometimes people say, um, well, if you give things to people, they don't appreciate it, right? If you're, and you probably know students, maybe at this university, I hope not, who have state scholarships, and they have good courses to go, but they don't care about it, you know? They just want to drink beer or whatever. And <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, but not just drink beer, right? Um, The other thing I think that brings this to mind, this question or this issue to mind to me, is that you cannot pay for these things. You can, you can pay a tutor, of course, to help you with English if you need it in certain ways. But you can't pay someone to write you an application. Because if you do, and what if it's good, and you go in for the interview, at the interview, there'll be Ukrainians and Americans sitting there talking to you, and they'll find out right away what's wrong here, right? It has to be you. And so you have to have the confidence when you write this application that this is you and you are good. That is, I'm, I'm telling you the good things about me and what I can do and what I want to do. and you might be surprised. Someone who reads it might understand. Can you get help with the English? You can. We expect certain mistakes. These, the, I know the Fulbright application has to be done in English. I'm not certain about the rotary. Yeah, that, that you want to find out, what language they use. But Fulbright has to be written out in English. Okay, that's very hard. It's hard even to understand what they're asking. We had that conversation today. What does this mean? I can't understand when I look at Russian forms what they want, right? So you do need help with these things. And um, you have an international office that's famous for helping people with that sort of thing and asking others to help you. The Fulbright office in Kiev will help you. They should. They always have before. So um, um, our Email me. I'll be working to help choose Fulbright professors to come to Ukraine to do what I did 10, 12 years ago. And I've been talking with your, um, um, your teachers, or I will be talking with some of your teachers about who we should get. If you had an American professor come to teach you, what would you like for the professor to teach you about? That would interest me. Hmm? English. English language. Good. Even though it's American, right? Teaching. What? Teaching. Teaching methods. Teaching methods. Education. You know, you're not the first person to mention that today. You're like the fifth or sixth person to mention that today. So it's beginning to... The methods of education. And, and you're a teacher or want to be an, an, a language teacher, that would be a good idea. What else? What do you feel 
philosophy or psychology. Oh. Okay. His history. Hmm? His history. History. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're my favorite so far. <laughs> but you know, I already came. Um, we've had a historian here. We've had a pianist here, and that was very good, apparently, in the culture. Had a psychologist here. I can't remember all the others. I think there was someone in economics or something like that, too. Um, anything else? Of the, or if, if they're going to teach history, what kind of history? Um, maybe um, history of USA and England. Okay. Ask for um, English teachers. I think it's a great idea. We tried to do that when we came. There wasn't a lot of interest 12 years ago. But we have such courses in our university. I hope I can talk English, to you. English literature and American literature. Okay, you have these courses, yes. but it might be good to hear. Uh, the native speaker yeah. and. Uh, and maybe different new yeah, ideas yes. using yes. different texts. Maybe culture, customs. I was wondering about cultural areas that you were interested in, uh, besides the regular language and literature. Are there cultural areas of American life that is particularly interesting right now? Uh, when I was here 12 years ago, rap music was pretty much coming along. Movies always, right? Yes. Film, cinema. It's it's something to study. It's something interesting. If you have a professor who knows, say, German, Russian, and American cinema, it can be quite interesting. What else? Does that capture most of your interest? What other kind of, uh, where would you go and what would you want to study there is another thing I'd like for you to take away with you. And, and, and do you feel like this is something you could or want to do? If the answer is yes, and you're not scared of TOEFL, and you're not scared of being alone for a few days, you're not scared of things that can happen to you along the way, like, well, nothing ever bad happens in Kherson, right? <laughs> and you're, you're pretty tough people. You can, you can deal with things. And smart too. So, but if all of that doesn't doesn't um, kill your desire uh, to try to do something, then you have to do what I did. You have to try to do it. You have to see if it will work. Why? Because we well, don't really know exactly why. I think when you begin, but you learn along the way. It involves all the things I've talked about and many things that I haven't talked about and involves things that you are thinking about or will come to know about yourself. When I, want, when I, when I began my education, uh, my country and your country were enemies. And we can't say that about Ukraine and the United States today. We can't even say that about the United States and Russia today. I won't. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. Um, we still have a lot of problems in our world that threaten um, our ability to get along with each other, to solve the problems, let's say, in your Black Sea neighborhood, where I think you should be in charge of solving these problems. I'm talking like a historian now. Um, but what I like is to come here, and often even in my bad Russian, to listen to people in the village. I'll be going to Radinsk tomorrow, and maybe to Kolony, someplace I've never been before. Do you know these places? Yes. <laughs> the people who grew up here know these places. I sit and I listen to people talk about what's important to them, and sometimes I have to ask them to stop and repeat it because I'm not quite sure what they're saying. And I think I'm the luckiest person in the world to be able to do this kind of work, to travel somewhere 
that was impossible. When I went to the IREX to East Germany, there were seven Americans living in East Germany. There's no place in the world where only seven Americans live, I think. Maybe North Korea, I'm not sure. So I've been given the chance to go places where other Americans did not go <coughs> early, like to Leipzig, like to Kherson, back then. Although I think a whole lot of Baptists from Texas came before I did. But, <laughs> but uh, American professor. And it makes me feel very lucky. And we are lucky if we get a chance for higher education. Not everybody gets it. So use it. Uh, how are we doing on time? Is it about over? We still have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I could just stay and talk to people who want to talk to me, or I could talk about other topics of interest to the officers. I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get more questions, but... Uh, Ребята, пожалуйста, вопросы подумайте. Yes. Yeah. How can I apply to the Fulbright uh, process? Okay, well, it's actually looks easy because there's a, just a website, Fulbright.org, right? No, that's the wrong one. It's IPE. Talk about the website or Google to get the right website for applying to the Fulbright program. But then you'll look at it, you'll say this is very complicated. So you need to go to the international office, and probably they have books, so it's a little easier to go through the brochures and the books where it'll go step by step. When should you apply? Before or during your last year here is the best time, and I'd say before. Go see if you can apply, so. Or if it is your last year, that's fine too. And. It's many stages, as I told you, you, um, you fill out the form, and maybe that's it. They say no. If they don't say no, that means they want to interview you, the next stage. And that's when the TOEFL and the trip to Kiev comes in. Maybe they do the trips to different countries. I, I think they all get interviewed in Kiev, but I'm not sure. That's the way we did it before. And then you can still fail at that level, but if you're chosen at that level, you're probably going to go. Because the only thing that would hold up, hold up your progress there would be the visa or some problem with your host institution. All these things have to work out together. And that's the Fulbright at master's level. Rotary, you can apply earlier. And they usually ask you to, um, in the application, to say something about you know, why you want to go, where you're going, what you're going to try to do. Uh, that's another thing I guess you should think of. You either want to study toward a degree, like they say a bachelor's degree in psychology, in therapy or something like that, or you're asked to define a certain project. I know we had one person, I think she ended up being successful, who was from Western Ukraine, and she noticed that a lot of the problems of native Ukrainians in that area, they, you know, the wars had pushed them away, they'd come back, and she also noticed that a lot of the art that they produced was very similar to American Indians. So she wanted to go to the University of Arizona and find out about the problems of American Indians and see if it would cast any light on the problems of Western Ukraine. Now, this struck us as being a very creative and imaginative idea. Moreover, when we asked her about the project, specific questions, she had already done a lot of work. She'd already tried to figure this out. She certainly knew the Ukrainian part very well and she had begun to think about what little she could find out about Native Americans. So she was ready to go. So you may have a project or an idea or something you would really like to do that sounds really crazy, which that one does, really, if you think about it. 
why, why do that? Uh, Americans like crazy ideas. Maybe not all, but I think most people in Bullbright do. Uh, because we see education systems, and I don't mean to criticize your professors or your administrators, but education systems produce one thing all the same. You know, over and over. This is what you should learn. This is it. Boom. If you do well, if you do exactly what we tell you, then you're good. No. Nah. <laughs> that's, that's not going to build the, the, the best new world, is it? Because exactly what you have, well, to use a not very nice word in English, it stinks, right? We have problems. I like to do something better or something different. I think this is a way, uh, and I'm not just talking about travel abroad here, but definitely if you have ideas that you could use a travel abroad experience to do something new or different, same with bringing in a Fulbright professor who could bring something different to you. Yes, American literature in a different way, but what if it's something really totally, um, you know, that just always wondered about, never heard about. Um, um, let's say Jamaicans in the United States, you know, <laughs> something like that. It sounds kind of crazy. It might involve dangerous ideas. Um, those are, I think, things to think about. Things that can uh, can change the world and not just make it better, let's say, in the ways that it's always been. Um, I teach, I give students marks according to what I think they should do. I really don't know. But, but sometimes I actually do disagree with my colleagues uh, because if a student comes to me with an essay that is truly original, maybe not all the best on the method that we taught, I tend to be more encouraging to that than the one that boringly follows all the requirements and all the rules. Why? Because you're, it's not just education that you're doing now. It's higher education. It's the world that is not happening yet, but will happen because you make it happen. That's what I like to think about. I like to think about, um, and I talked to the pro-rector about that, he said, in 50 years, southern Ukraine is going to be a really wonderful place. Everyone will want to come here. And it's true. You have nature. You have food. Oh my God, do you have food? And drink. The wines are always getting better. Um, you have weather. Better than the places in the United States, really. Why shouldn't this be just the world's tourist destination? He said, it will be, and the culture we have here will be part of it. He said, but I'm not going to live long enough to see it. He doesn't think, but you will. See, that's the difference. You will. And you're not only long enough to see it, you will make it happen. And how are you going to do it? How are you going to change the things that need to be changed or bring new ideas uh, where they're needed? Um, that's what I like to think about. And I see your smiles and I think you're saying, oh, he has no idea, you know, what we want to do. <laughs> um, but, um, but I don't know, maybe. Uh, again, I hope I'm not too old to enjoy some of it. Um, some of it already has happened, really. I've seen big changes in Ukraine. I have a question. Well, uh, what kind of information uh, do we have to give out uh, in the Fulbright program, for example? Okay. Well, I mentioned two different kinds of things. One is you identify a program that you want to go to. They're, they're interested in what are you interested in. So it's either a program that you want to go to or a specific project that you think could be carried out in that place. For some of them, they want both, but 
I would think in terms of those two things. Uh, if, it's, if it's just to study psychology, you just say why, you know, and mention the things you're interested in, but you'll do whatever it is the program. For other things, like you want to do in America, or the arts in America, specific project that you want to do. So be prepared to think about those things. The other information is just the information about yourself. You will have to produce um, uh, the uh, report about your grades. I'm not sure about high school, but definitely college grades. You'll have to get recommendations from teachers or other people important to your education. I think they can write them in their native language. That's not a problem. Um, although your English teachers, I'm sure, will be happy to write them in English. <laughs> um, but it might not just be English. So uh, I'm trying to think of what else is involved. Uh, are you concerned about information that they might want about you? No, well, I know that for some of them, if you happen to be married, uh, you can still get the thing, you know, it, it, it doesn't, and some, I, I think for the first Fulbright when your spouse can't go with you, but for the later ones, they give you extra money for flying, so sometimes even your marital situation is not a problem, it might be for some of them, uh, you might not get support for your family, but just for one person. What other kinds of information did you imagine that they'd want to know? I just wanted to ask. Is, it won't have anything to do with where you're from. In fact, it's probably an advantage if you're not from a big city. Because that's, we see a lot of them. Kiev, Lviv, Kharkov, Dnepropetrovsk, you see a lot of that. Um, Kherson, Nikolaev, Mariupol, those are not so often. And that raises some attention. Uh, from the committee. I said, well, let's look at this. And I would ask you not to be shy to tell about your own interests. Don't write a, rec a letter or don't write an application to give somebody what they want because you probably don't know what they want. Go ahead and tell them who you are and what your interests are. And People who read them can tell the difference. You can tell the difference, it's just like I'm sure your teachers are, when you read each other's essays, you can tell the person just did exactly what they were supposed to do, or if they actually had real interest in the subject when they wrote it, and as I say, wrote it from the heart. Can you overdo it and make it too sentimental or too bleeding? Yes, but you'll get advice on these things. I would start with writing as open and as sometimes a little stupidly or even bragging as you can to make sure that you're bringing out all the good qualities that you have and then rewrite it to make it really represent how you think you are. So I always tell my students when they apply for something, brag a lot. Tell how you're the best. <laughs> then rewrite it and try to be as careful and frank as you try to say who you are, you know, with this rewriting. But don't forget to tell what you can do. Don't forget to let the people know what your strengths are. Is, are these things hard to write? They are terribly hard to write. And they're hard even to begin with. Because usually when you sit down and write something, say, what does the professor want? Oh, I know how to do that. Do it, right? There's none of that here. This comes from you. So it's more like a, what you call a creative project, I think, than it is an academic project. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in such things uh, that today all the students have an opportunity to work in summer camps. Mm -hmm. And as for me, I spend the whole summer working in such camps. And do you know, are there any programs in USA connected with working in work summer camps? There's work and travel in summer camps. No, as I read, uh, yes, uh, work and travel. It is a very good opportunity. First of all, you will work as a wage with or... You will do what? Wages. Wages. They don't have very good wages? No, as I hear. As I hear. Uh, First of all, they're not in such professions. I think, I know one student who came from uh, 
um, Nova Kafoka. He's a student here. And he worked in one of our summer camps in northern Wisconsin. He loved the water, obviously. He loved boats. And northern Wisconsin in the summer is just full of these summer camps for children. Now, they paid, uh, I think, I have to ask him if they paid his way there or somehow they met him, the, met him maybe at the Chicago airport. But he didn't have any trouble getting there. And maybe he didn't get a very good wage, but he didn't have to pay for his, you know, you're in a camp, you don't pay to be at the camp. They give you a place to stay with the other people who work there. He did not travel maybe once or twice from there because it was so isolated. But after it was over, he had a whole month. He didn't want to spend much of his own money because he'd save some. So he called me up and came to stay with me the whole month. And I tried to get to travel and see as much as we possibly could together, but, uh, and then took him to the plane after it was over. So even at a summer camp that looks like it might not be much money, if you have a way of putting it together with something else um, that could get you closer to, I know we went to Kansas City and St. Louis, I can't remember, I think he went to Chicago later on. Uh, he got to see a few things, but mostly he just enjoyed living in my big university town and doing what we do in Columbia, Missouri. So, uh, including going on some more boats on some more lakes, that's what he really liked. So it's possible uh, through work and study, I think you'd have difficulty doing it other ways because you'd have to find somebody to um, sponsor the visa. There is a, a Camp USA. Camp USA? And they will help with locations and visa? Uh, yes, and I think they are buying you the ticket to fly to the USA. So they can give you the ticket. Uh, but uh, the salary, like we said, is very low. So, but think about whether you need very much money. Like, what if you don't spend any of it while you're there? They feed you, they give you a place to live. In the United States, a place to live and the food costs hundreds of dollars a week, right? So you're not spending that. So be, get some advice on doing the calculation. Because I think that's the thing you can't understand. I can't understand the calculation of prices in Kherson. I go to the market and beautiful um, um, peppers, parrots, right? Four rima a kilogram. You know, we pay for one pepper 10 rima, maybe more. One pepper. I said, well, you know, in America people earn more money, right? How does that all work out? I don't know. It's, it's crazy. You can't even... It, it's difficult to think about it. We, they sent us here to teach in Kherson, and they gave us maybe half what we earn in the United States. So many people, when they get the Fulbright and see that you're not going to get very much money to teach in Ukraine, um, they won't do it. I mean, one of my friends, he didn't want to go to Hungary. He wouldn't get enough money, he thought. I didn't spend the money here, right? I saved, I think, $20,000 while I was working here. Now, I didn't go to Paris, and I didn't go to Rome, and etc. I went one time to Moscow and stayed with friends. Uh, I went a lot of places in Ukraine, and I went to Warsaw, too. So, it's all a matter of what you do. And that has to do with the place you choose to study, too. In my town of Columbia, Missouri, you can spend maybe $200, $300 a month to live with other people, right, in an apartment. In the town I teach in, a small village north of that, the students don't want to pay more than $100 or $200. If you're in downtown Chicago or in New York, You'd better have $1,000 a month just to pay for rent, right? So these are things you need to know. 
before you decide where to go and why. And you might find that the camp is not a bad deal in terms of the wages, as let's say the theme park would be near St. Louis if the rents are high there. You, know, you have to ask people about that sort of thing. It's complicated. It's a complicated world uh, out there. And don't ever forget to ask the people who are in charge of your program for help when something looks wrong to you. If you think that you're being asked to do something that you're not supposed to do, or to pay for something that you didn't think you had to pay for, um, I don't think any of these organizations want to have anything bad happen to the student who, who goes there. That was true. You know, the Fulbrighters were very, Fulbright was very concerned about how the Americans could deal with things in Ukraine. They get a lot of phone calls about the lack of hot water and that sort of thing. Well, okay, you know, the program is in charge. The program must help you. So don't be too polite to ask. Don't be too polite to ask again. <laughs> and uh, be sure uh, that uh, you're getting the best experience that you can get because you'll be passing your experiences on to the next generation soon enough. Is that all the time? Yes. I thank you so much for your questions and for your attention today. Thank you very much.